The next guest that we've got up uh, here tonight, this this is going to be a real a pleasure to have this uh, gentleman on. Somebody who has uh, we we talked about previously, very accomplished guy. Very few people in their lives make it to the point of playing with one big time group. He's done it uh, more than once here. Uh, the most famous of them being Santana and Journey, making the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Santana. Presently, uh, a very noteworthy. Uh, project that it is out with uh, his, his own band that he's got, uh, the Greg Raleigh uh, Band, and a, uh, a limited edition CD uh, of the, uh, the band in concert called Rain Dance. So we've got a lot to talk about uh, with the, this gentleman here, but uh, again, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Greg Raleigh in the FDH Lounge. Uh, Greg, welcome to the program tonight, sir. How you doing? Fine, thanks. How are you, Greg? I'm great. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we, previously uh, on the show here, it's it, it, it's interesting. Is we, we we've only had on uh, a few folks over a period of time that that have that have been in bands, but just kind of a weird thing here. Uh, previously, we had on, uh, of course, your old uh, bandmate uh, Steve Smith. He's one of the uh, the other guys from the world of music who's uh, been on with us. Who, uh, again, uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you. Uh, you you know that better than anybody. One of the very greatest of all time uh, at, at at his, uh, uh, you know, on the drums there. No question. Yeah, he is. He's great. He's one of the best drummers around. I haven't seen him in years, but uh, it's been about five, six years maybe I've seen him. I hardly see any of those guys anymore. You know, we all went our separate ways. And uh, saw Ross Valerie when we I played in Pleasanton, California. He came by because he lives close. Mm-hmm. And uh, but other than that, you know, it's like every year or two or something I might see somebody. Well, se- separate ways, uh, very uh, very apropos. But yeah, that's uh, that's, yeah. What can, <laughs> that's what can happen sometimes. You know, at uh, bands. Will will sometimes splinter and 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 people will come and go. Uh, you yourself have had uh, a heck of a career, really done a whole lot. I know that uh, our FDH New York bureau, who got you booked, uh, I, again, you you are a, a big favorite of his, uh, as you are with uh, a number of us, with a number of people. Uh, so he was happy to get you booked uh, for tonight. But additionally. Uh, the timing of it as well, and I think that's where I like to start here tonight. Uh, we just had the milestone come and go recently here, 40 years since Woodstock, you being somebody who played there. I guess the thing that, and I, I don't think I've interviewed anybody before who uh, who played at Woodstock, so I, I guess the first question that would come to my mind would be, with all the mythology of it and what it was like for all you know, the great performances of it over a couple of days and you know the rain and the mud and all of that, what part is there of the mythology of the way people think that it was that 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 rings as inaccurate to you or 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 does that whole picture that everybody talks about of those couple of days pretty much cover it accurately? I can't remember you got another question <laughs> I'm, no I'm kidding. <laughs> If you remember it, you probably weren't there, right, Greg? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's the old story. No, I, I remember pretty much what went on. I, you know, the it is it's forty years ago, and everything becomes kind of hindsight. And and I think the the major point that uh, everybody needs to understand is that Michael Wadley actually filmed it. There was a there was a ton of big um, uh, big festivals. Uh, you know, 50,000 people, well, you know, which, of course, got dwarfed by Woodstock. But they were big, and they were huge, and we played a lot of them. And so this was just going to be another one. It was supposed to be 200,000 people, but uh, kind of like close encounters, everybody showed up and went to the mountain. You know, I mean, they just had to. So it ended up being 500,000 people. People parked on the uh, on the highway. The, the highways were closed, but they had to regroup on how they were going to get bands in and then they had to regroup about what band was going to play when uh because some of them were stuck on the freeway and so uh it it became pretty much of a mess but the i think the real story behind it is the people that went the five hundred thousand people is the real story to the thing which is i think portrayed a little better in um the re-release of the of uh, from warner brothers of Woodstock 40, which has about three more hours of information in it, and it, it kind of tells the story of how it was done. Wadley wisely filmed uh, from the get-go before, you know, Yesler's farm, while it was a farm, all the way to the garbage at the end. And so you really got a picture of what was going on there, and now they've talked to people uh, 
you know, 40 years later, and I, I think they've added things like that. I haven't even seen it all yet, and uh, but it, and plus new performances. So it's there's bands there that nobody knew that were there. For instance, Creedence Clearwater. Uh, I didn't know they played. We we played one day. We went on earlier than we were supposed to, um, and we stayed there to see Sly Stone, and then we drove out, and that was it. And I, you know, I knew of the. I knew of the bands who played just like everybody else after the movie was out. I really, we didn't consider it to be, at the time, we never talked about Woodstock after we played it. It was like on to the next thing. But because it was filmed and it has become the grandfather to all of these things and there was no violence and it was a, a moment in time of, of a bunch of kids telling the world how they think it ought to be um, and it was filmed. It became what it became, and now it's you know nostalgic and uh, uh, almost uh, a myth and a, you know in history all at once. You know, and, that's the best way I can explain it. Well, that that's that's a good explanation. I you, you mentioned a couple of things there. I think that that lead to some uh, potential follow up questions. I, I wasn't even thinking along these lines until you said something uh, late in your response there, in passing almost about how it was nonviolent, but. Have you ever allowed that to cross your mind now that I think about it as far as it being something like Altamont? I mean, what what if it got ugly? Has that ever crossed your mind that, like, thank God it never came to that? Or with all these people there and all the drugs and everything that was going on, what would have happened if it ever would have gone that way? Have you ever Has your mind ever allowed you to go there in, in terms of what it would have been like to try to survive a scenario like that? No. As a matter of fact, it, I think the whole point to it is nobody thought that way. Um and that's why it worked. Nobody thought of it that way. They just went there to to go enjoy themselves, and and so they, they weren't, nobody's looking for a tough time. I'm sure, I'm sure there, there had to be a scuffle here and there, but nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, Altamont was a the mo- uh, It was one of the most poorly planned things that has ever happened, mm-hmm. and which you know happened. I don't know a month later, two months, whatever it mm-hmm. was. Can't even remember. When we played that too, and I saw a guy get beat up right in front of me while I'm playing, and it's not really what I signed up to do, and. Um, you know, and it was ugly, but the stage was three feet off the ground. You can't do that with 200,000 people. Woodstock was better planned. It was, it was a huge stage. People could see it. They couldn't, you know, it was it was more organized in that fashion. They really tried to do things right. They had a, mm-hmm. a, a, a revolving stage that broke because the weight was too heavy for it so that they could move bands on quickly, and they ended up having to do it the same old way that everybody did. And... Uh, but they tried to. They really, they, you know, Michael Lang really thought this stuff out as best he could. And Michael Lang's an interesting character because uh, he looks the same. And, and I asked him, how, did, how come? I mean, I look pretty good, but this is ridiculous. Uh-huh. And uh, he, uh, because I don't stress over things. And the more I think about it, if he didn't stress over Woodstock, then he doesn't stress over things. That, and that's why he looks at and feels as good as he does. Well, maybe that was the key to the planning, the fact that the guy doesn't stress out a lot. Because, as you said, it was sort of one extreme to the other, planning Woodstock and everything that went into that versus Altamont. I mean, the bottom line on Altamont, sometimes you can sum, th- sum up something in one sentence. The Hell's Angels doing security, okay? Wh- whoever yeah. thought something could go wrong with that, huh? Well, you know, Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead, and, and Janis Joplin, the, and the uh, airplane, all they were all friends with the with the angels i knew a bunch of angels okay doing, you know apart yeah they're okay but given that scenario i don't think that was too smart and uh obviously it wasn't so it, it ended up being a disaster yeah and that was kind of the end of all of that but it, getting back to your question about woodstock being that way no never crossed my mind in fact it never crosses my mind to go play music that violence is going to be involved although it is it has happened well that's you know, very- it just, I, and I think most people who go there for that, at least from that generation, sure. nowadays, you almost have to expect a little problem here and there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, depending on what musical acts are involved, yeah, it, it almost Yeah, might- I mean, whatever, whoever's got the gig, you know, sometimes they, you know, they bring an entourage of people that uh, are looking for trouble. Yeah. It, it can, uh, it can, it's a it different can world, that's all. It can happen, definitely. Uh, yeah. The other question that I would have for you about that would be one of scope, because you were talking about, you know, you guys did a lot of big festivals and 50,000, you, you wouldn't blink at that, whatever. 
this is what I wonder about. You know, for 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 a band like yours that was used to being uh, on huge stages like that and, and playing uh, on stages the likes of which most bands can't can't even dream of. How big of a difference is there in scale between 50,000 and 500,000? Like in terms of stage fright, in terms of anything that, that you might have there, is it a deal where if you're comfortable playing the 50, 500 is not going to rattle you? At, at what point, if any, does it kick in and you start thinking, oh, my God, this is, this is the biggest thing that we're ever going to be a part of? I think it's a little scarier to go play a small club. Okay. Because, uh, I mean, you're... They're right there. They, yeah. I mean, they, they can see your eyeballs, your you know nose hairs practically. <laughs> so uh, they're they're going to get a whole a whole eyeful, earful, and up close and personal. I think that's a little more difficult than it is to play to a big crowd because it becomes uh, almost impersonal, but it's not, of course. But it, it's not the same. It's uh, you know, and in between fifty thousand, five hundred thousand. Hey. After the first 10,000, it's all hair and teeth. So it just is wave of brown. That's what it looked like. And plus, during Woodstock, Santana was the type of band that we played like jazz players. We played to each other um, almost in a circle. And uh, it, it wasn't like necessarily projected towards the audience, like Sly Stone projected everything towards the audience. He was like, uh, he was brilliant, by the way. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, but we played a, a whole different way. We wanted to be an internationally known band, and we played to each other, and and it was all about the music. And there just happened to be five hundred thousand people there watching what we do. And that's kind of the way we approached it. So it it never, I did not I, playing to five hundred thousand people did not strike me until we left because we flew in in helicopters. You you can't tell a mountain of people, but you, you really have no way of judging it, mm -hmm. and uh, at least I didn't, but when we drove out, uh, it's, uh, what I was telling you about the personal, I mean, there they are, right there, you can see their nose hairs, too, and you're <laughs> driving out, and it was forever to get out of there, and then it was unbelievable, so if we had driven in, it might have scared me to death. <laughs> That, that's really interesting. I mean, you know, some people might think that that's counterintuitive, but I, I can kind of get where you're coming from when, when you're face to face with a smaller group of people. And, and, and I can tell you that, too. Just, you know, for, I can relate to that because when we've done remotes like here from the station, I find it more daunting to be in a room full of people as opposed to, you know, however many people are out there listening to us, which dwarf, you know, whatever's in the room physically listening to us. But, yeah, I guess that's just a human thing you know to find smaller sure settings. I, the other thing is uh for a musician or at least for me is uh, speaking instead of playing mm -hmm. speaking like you know I, I get just as nervous as anybody else sure and uh but playing music i don't well uh, that, I, that's that's true yeah I, I guess if that was a problem for you you probably wouldn't make it that far right <laughs> uh there's a lot of people that have done it. i red skeleton used to get sick before he go on to to do his uh his comedy practically throw up and uh which was a uh, amazing to me the guy was brilliant but you know he had a, a sense of stage fright it was probably what i've been talking about oh my god they're right there uh -huh. <laughs> you know? I, mean, I better be good yeah it, it it's only human i suppose to uh to have that uh happen uh yeah, you know, i'd it's like a wonder... to be called that that would be good yeah i guess it's a, it's a wonder it doesn't happen to more uh, people, but uh, you know, in terms of the overall musical journey that you you've been on, which has sort of culminated uh, with, with with your present uh, band right now, one of the next big steps along the way for you, you know, you played with Santana. That was where you uh, you know made your bones for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Part of another band that I think well, most of us fully expect will be there someday in Journey. Uh, and, and and talk about what that was like again with with you as the uh, the vocalist back in the day, uh, pre Steve Perry, and then uh, you know. Faith into somewhat, somewhat of a dual role with him, transitioning, being a versatile part of the band. Talk about what that was like to be able to play different roles with a band like that and, and do them all well. Uh, well, number one, Journey was, uh, when it started out, was more of a fusion rock band. It was about solos, kind of where Santana left off, at least for Neil and I. Mm -hmm. A lot of soloing, and uh, uh, the, but the songs were not Latin uh, or Latin-based. And uh, it was more rock-based and, and into fusion, you know, almost jazz. Uh, but it was rock. And um, 
the, the way we wrote songs was, it was based on, the thing that got everybody high was all the solo work. And so we, we, we played on that. The band could play, we could sell more tickets than we could sell, uh, than we could sell albums. And back then, uh, record companies actually gave you a chance. We put out three records, and, and they backed them as best they could during that time period. And uh, we would go out and tour and, you know, sell out a lot of places. And so the band was really primed and ready to go. Uh, it, uh, it was well known throughout the United States. Uh, you know, it was a theater-filling band at the time. And then we made the decision, or actually I think CBS made it for us. They they wanted us to have a singer, a lead singer, because that was the, the, time, the day of the lead singer, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, everybody had to have a focal point, to, you know. I thought the Beatles did fine with three of them, so yeah. I don't know, I mean four, actually. Uh-huh. But but that's the way the business went, and so we went went after a singer, which I actually wasn't opposed to because I've been doing lead singing, playing two or three keyboards at a time, and harmonica, and uh, kind of spread out. So this would be different, and why not? And so we started writing songs at that point uh, after the next album, into infinity when Perry got involved uh, to to writing songs for singing and doing actual backgrounds and something I'd never done not not to that extreme um, and so it was a, a total flip flop from what I was weaned on which was Santana and uh, kind of difficult to uh, to try and figure out how to go about all this stuff also instead of a lot of minor keys there was a lot of major keys and so it it was just a complete flip for me, and but I enjoyed it, and I liked doing it. I liked having uh, the uh, uh, dual vocals and things of that nature, and I didn't mind taking a back seat on, on singing at the time. And so, you know, it became what it became, and, and it, it just started to explode. Um, we, uh, we had to beat it up. I think, of, you know, Santana was a, a phenomenon that we kind of put this together and we caught the, uh, a generation of our time and we caught the, um, uh, the timing was perfect. It was, you know, being in Woodstock, Bill Graham loved the band. I, it was just a million things that happened, and so it rapidly went skyrocketing into um, being known. And Journey was more of a, a working project. It was... That's the part that I was very impressed with the manager, Herbie Herbert. He, he just stuck that out. And uh, we kept pounding, and, you know, within about five, four or five years, it started to really grow. And then, of course, when uh, after the Captured album, which was my last one, and I picked Jonathan Cain to replace me. I had no idea that he could uh, write some of the stuff that he wrote, but... He, I, he could play anything I was playing, and he played guitar as well. And so Neil kind of wanted that. And so on my exit, when I left, I said, you ought to look into this guy. And so that's what they did, and they, they got a hold of him. And the rest of it is, you know, 80 million records later. There you go. On a side note, and I, uh, I have a few more things I want to ask you about music, but on a side note here, I'm reminded of one we had on Steve Smith. And if I remember correctly... Uh, he sort of disabused us of the notion that uh, Journey Escape was the continuing cash cow that everybody uh, thinks it was. Wasn't there some kind of a deal cut where uh, you know, everybody probably thinks that you guys are you know, uh, living in houses of 24 uh, karat gold off of that uh, video game, but uh, it didn't quite work out that way from, from the way he portrayed it? Oh, from uh, you know what? After I left the, the business, I, I left it all to those guys. I just kind of walked away and uh, and, you know, let them go on about their business. Part of the escape stuff. I have no idea. Oh, okay, okay. They should have. I got a feeling that they they did better than what Steve said, but <laughs> uh, I have no idea. I really don't. I can't answer it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't know if you knew anything about that or not. What what strikes me here, I, I'm just. 
I'm seeing a sense of segues in terms of looking at your career that just seem kind of smooth and logical because you talk about the early days of Journey having a lot in common with Santana, minus perhaps some of the Latin influences of it. Certainly one would look at your career and look at Journey and, and then everything that you did with the Storm and see a lot of similarities uh, there as well. It, 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 it seems as though, you know, it just A, from some of the, the core members being the same, but also stylistically, uh, was that another case of things just kind of, you know, flowing in kind of a, a, a smooth manner for you? Well, actually, no. As a matter of fact, I started writing some songs with, with Kevin Chalfant, uh the singer from The Storm, and um, we were just going to write some songs and see if we can get them placed. Mm -hmm. It was kind of out of the game. And uh, Interscope Records was just starting up, and Herbie Herbert, I sent him a couple of the songs that I wrote, and he loved them, and he, uh, it's a funny story, he uh, Bo Hill, who was uh, vice president of Interscope at the time and in charge of, of that style of music, uh, asked Herbie, he goes, is there, you know, is there any bands around that you know of? Da, 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 da. He goes, I got a ton of tapes. And he, they were at a show, and he was in his Mercedes, and he pulls out a tape, and it just happened to be ours. He slammed it in his machine, and uh, Bo Hill goes, who the hell is that? <laughs> and uh, he goes, it's Greg Raleigh. He goes, you're kidding me. And so I got a call from them about that, and uh, I started up the band. I said, he goes, I, I love your stuff. It was arranged to be, at first, just a, uh, a solo act, you know, and I would have Kevin sing on this and that. I said, I think I got a better idea. What if I got Smith and Ross Valerie and myself? You got something more to talk about, three guys from Journey and, and Kevin Chalfont, and uh, the guitar player was Josh Raymond. And, um, and, and we'll take it from there. And we just started writing songs, and I had a, a co-writer uh, uh, help me, Bob Marlette, that uh, uh, co-produced uh, the second album, I believe it was. At any rate, we wrote these songs, and they were, they, you know, one of them got to be uh, number 13 or something, uh, and, and, then, and then Interscope change who they were going to be I, that was uh, i've got a lot to learn about love and uh and it, it became a huge hit and if we had had one more out of there we might be talking about something else right now interesting and, but but interscope changed who they were they went to nine inch nails and rap from there and it, you know they went with the flow i couldn't be mad at them I, i'd already had my uh my uh, day in the sun twice not bad Exactly. Yeah, that's the modern image of, of Interscope as, as we've come to think of it over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, that direction sure. that, that, that you described there. Uh, what I'm curious about, again, with, with uh, the Storm having had uh, as many uh, Journey alums as, as it had here, something I'd like to ask you about. This was something that uh, our, our New York Bureau, uh, uh, our producer, had uh, dug up in the course of his research here. Uh, this uh, this near-miss at, at least in terms of that's that's how it's been reported publicly here on a journey reunion and tour in 1994 here. I mean, the, the, the word is just from, from, I guess, what he had come up with and uh, from what's out there on the Internet that uh, there was a moment where it looked like it might happen. Uh, you guys, Steve Perry, all getting together to put it back together. It didn't happen. Uh, what uh, what was the story behind that? Well, it was prior prior to Perry being involved, the... the uh, the real deal was it, it was pretty much designed by Herbie and uh, and Neil that they were well let's go out and do this and they called me and they, I, I was involved with possibly doing this and, then, and I think um, uh, along with Jonathan which doesn't, didn't bother me that'd be fine you know you play what you play I play what I play it could be in, enormous and and a lot of fun and. Um, and that just did did not happen. Uh, Perry got involved and uh, exit Herbie and exit Greg, and that's kind of where that went. Um, I, I don't think I have to disclose too much of why it happened. Sure. I mean, here comes Perry, and there goes everything up in smoke. Okay. So, so it, it, that's just the way it went. And those guys went on to do uh, um, a CD. I mean, that was when the Eagles came out. And did uh, uh, did sort of the same thing, the same idea. They 
got their, themselves back together and they went on a tour and I think Fleetwood Mac did it and there was a bunch of bands that did it. And if, had, had that had happened with Journey, the thing would have never lulled for a second. But uh, that didn't happen. Well, it's an interesting thing to have you uh, comment on, yeah, because it, uh, it it's intriguing that uh, it came so close to happening and yet ultimately didn't. So sometimes the things that, that offer the most intrigue are the ones that don't happen for whatever reason. And uh, you know, you got to remember one thing. I, you know, sometimes you just can't go back. It just, yeah. you know, some people can, some people can't, and if they can't, they can't, and that's the way it goes. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's kind of what was going on there. There's a lot of political games and. Um, things that, uh, that I think I think most people are over at this point, you know. From okay. That. But you know that it is the, the way it is. It's like uh, I don't think I could go back and do Santana again because uh, it just it won't be the same. It's almost like you would no fault involved. Just sure. you, it's like you would expect things to be a certain way because that's the way it was when you left. And it might not be. And sometimes it's just you got to leave it alone, you know. Oh, sure. It, 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 it turns out to be better. The, for instance, with Santana, um, I'm very proud to have been in both bands. And, and, uh, but especially Santana because we created something that nobody had ever done ever, uh, you know, a, a type of music. And at the time, I never looked at it that way. We were just playing but I never looked at it as though we created a style of music that nobody had ever played before. And that's a real feather for me. I, I, uh, I'm real proud of that, and I love that stuff. It's kind of why I went back to it, because uh, I was weaned on it, and every time I'd sit down and play something, it would be in that genre or blues. It, it's always that. So I just stay there. Sure. You know, and, and now to ask you about your, your present band, which is sort of the culmination of our conversation, which, it, fittingly, because it, it seems like in some ways it's the culmination of your career, uh, the Greg Raleigh Band. Uh, we, we, we've got a CD that's on the way from the Glass Onion folks. I'm looking forward to checking it out. For right now, all I can go by is uh, the material that I've read about that and, and, and everything I've come across in that way. And It seems to have a lot of influences uh, from uh, the work that you've done throughout your career. I mean, it seems to have a little bit of uh, the classic uh, Santana sound as you've been talking about uh, some parts of journey I'm guessing probably more so uh, the earlier uh, days uh, of that of, of, of uh, more, more of like the jam session type uh, part but uh, why, why don't you describe it Greg what, when people come to see you and oh by the way I'm looking at your schedule here our flagship city for the network is Cleveland Ohio I see that you're going to be in the suburb of Avon at all pro freight freight stadium on September 19th you also have a date in Palmdale California at the amphitheater but for the po the folks coming out to catch the remainder of your 2009 tour, how would you uh, best describe the sound of the Greg Rowley band? Well, the, it basically, I, I went back to, to my roots on Santana. I play uh, the, major, the major songs from the first three albums, and, uh, and then uh, new material that's in the same genre. And uh, the reason why it's got a little, the, the newer music has... Um, Guess uh, how do I put this? When I got into Journey, I learned how to craft a better song, and uh, so it wasn't just a few more changes, a few more melodies, you know, just just a little bit different stuff. It's still in the same genre, but uh, but the songs are crafted pretty well, and there's there's a little more to them uh, in the new material, but it is still. I hate to use the term Latin rock, but that's what everybody likes to call it, and because uh, it is a combination of uh, Latin, blues, jazz, rock, uh, you name it, it's in there. Um, at any rate, so that is what I've been doing, and uh, and the band plays this stuff unbelievably, and and that is the CD you're going to get. You'll see it like uh, I've been coining the phrase "It's Santana the way you remember it." Oh, excellent. Excellent. I'm looking looking forward to that, and uh, I just happen to notice this on your website. Really, as we were talking now about the tour date, uh, I'm hopeful of uh, potentially being able to get out there to All Pro Freight Stadium in Avon myself to check it out. But at any rate, uh, Greg, uh, you know it's it's a pleasure to have you on. Of course, uh, your website, gregraleigh.com. We always like to give everybody a chance to plug uh, on this uh, program here. In addition to this uh, CD and anything people can find on your website, anything else that they should be aware of? Well, I mean, you can you can purchase that on CD Baby. You can go to 
Avalon, iTunes, I, you know, all of it's everywhere. So if they're interested in it, uh, there it is. I have, I've gotten some rave reviews about this CD, and, uh, which uh, is great. I, you know, it's really about playing live for me at this point, though. It's like this is a limited edition. Okay. We're not going to make a ton of these, I don't think. So it, unless there's, you know, it goes off the chart somehow, but uh-huh. we'll see. I, I can't wait to hear it, uh, Greg. You, you've had a fascinating uh, career all through the years, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, uh, much great music, I'm sure, ahead of you. It was a pleasure to have you on the show for the first time. We look forward to doing it again sometime, sir. All right. Thanks, Rick. Thanks so much, Greg. Greg Raleigh, everyone, from the Greg Raleigh Band, previously of Santana and Journey.